Welcome to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do pretty much every Sunday. Uh, typically I film these much later in the week. I'm actually filming this on Monday because I'm doing some traveling this week and usually I show off a little more of the garden, but we have absolute chaos uh, out here <laughs> with some uh, work going on here uh, around the house and uh, mulching and 25 other projects going on, it seems like, at one time. So I, I'm over here in a corner uh, shooting, but I think you'll see over the next couple of weeks, uh, big, big, uh, uh, some big progress made out here in the garden. It should look good. This should look great this spring. The I announced the weekly garden planner last week, and so far March, April, and May are up on the weekly garden planner. If you didn't watch last week's video, the weekly garden planner is literally going to be months broken down into weeks over things that we do here in our garden in Raleigh or think about during these these chunks of the months, you know, throughout the year, uh, and you know, just how we, you know, just basically break things down into bites, you know, from pruning, fertilizing, mulching, weeding, just garden task of all types, uh, broken down. Uh, we've got again, there's three months on it so far. Thank you guys so much to have uh, jumped right in and signed up for it. I really do appreciate it. There's a thirty dollar discount code that'll be good through April for the just initial launch of this. By the end of April, we'll have at least June and July up as well. So that'll be at least five months at that point. We've already already well underway working on those. And the Learn to Garden video series, which also has a discount code below the video here, is also getting new content as well. One is just basically for learning gardening and the other one will be for maintaining gardening, your garden. Uh, there should be a transplant video. By the time you see this video, <laughs> There should be a transplanting video that's gone up of a viburnum that was in the front garden over to another house, a garden resources video, uh, just some resources that we use, uh, you know, in gardening, uh, some, some ones I've used over the years, and then an odd jobs neighborhood combo tour from the garden here. Anyway, there you go. So there's some of the things from this past week. And again, thank you so much for considering the weekly garden planner. I think it's going to get better and better and, uh, there's going to be some other things added to it uh, coming up that we're excited about it as well, but I don't want to talk about those yet until they actually are happening. Uh, so let's jump into some questions. Uh, is there an issue with water quality from water off roofs and gutters if they collect it? Is it unhealthy for the plants? No, rainwater is the best kind of water. Unless, you know, you want to use it, you know, pretty quickly. I don't know how it's being stored, but you will notice a giant difference in how your plants perform from rainwater versus any kind of city collected water. There's not, it's night, it's night and day. When we got periods of rain in our, uh, in our nursery, you know, where we, where we could go three, four, five, six days in a row without actually overhead irrigating from our stagnant pond water, it was absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible the growth that we would get on plants during that period of time. So rainwater is just way better overall. Uh, than any kind of city, you know, any kind of city water. Uh, so, uh, you know, I highly encourage you to, uh, to use it and you will actually see growth and, you know, difference in growth. And in fact, nurseries, I've noticed nurseries with really good plant material, uh, really consistently good plant material, move a lot of their, move a lot of water on their property. So they'll take a low pond and they'll pump the pond up to the top and it'll drop through three, pond, three ponds rather than just a, one, a single stagnant pond that they're watering from. Uh, it seems like, the, or the larger the water space is frequently, the better the plants look in that nursery. And it's that moving water. That moving water is super, super helpful. It's more oxygenated, I think. Okay, uh, so somebody said they heard oak leaf hydrangea responds poorly to pruning. Does this, does this mean to ignore crossing or rubbing branches? No, anything that threatens the, threatens your plant in some way, a branch that's hanging down that you think is going to create a weak spot where that it's eventually going to crack and fall off and it's gonna end up peeling the bark off the side of the tree. Uh, anything, that, anything that you think is going to harm the plant in the future, crossing branches especially, and this is still a good time of year before everything is completely leafed out to be examining the inside of your plants for crossing branches. Okay, um, will the scale, the scale on crepe myrtles spread to Japanese na maples nearby? It's unlikely. Um, sun is coming out on me here. I don't know how this is. Hopefully this still look pretty good. Uh, will the scale on my crepe myrtles spread to my Japanese maple? No, uh, this is definitely 
a scale that's specific to crepe myrtles. There probably will be a few other plants that it will, I don't want to say no, because there probably will be a few other plants. So we will get what we would call magnolia scale, but it might go on other, a few other plants. So there, there, there are these crossover things and they can cross plant families and all kinds of things. But typically if one has a name like crepe myrtle bark scale, uh, it is really very specific to crepe myrtle bark uh, and maybe, some, maybe something else. I doubt it's going to get on your Japanese maples, what I'm trying to say, but it's not completely out of the question. It probably will jump to something else. Um, I don't know what that will be. Uh, let's see. Somebody bought two Carolina Midnight Laura Petalum, two Bigfoot Clara, two Elysium, which is the least cold hardy and would benefit from protection. Probably the Laura Petalum overall would be the least cold hardy to winter winds. Uh, the Clara second, and then the Elysium is probably the most cold hardy. I don't know. Okay, I've got a Florida uh, Sunshine Elysium right here, and I've got Elysium Parviflorum here. I don't know if it can be seen or not. Uh, I don't know what the framing is here. Uh, both of these are considered like 6B, 7A hardy, definitely, whereas the Laura Petalum is seven to nine, seven to 10. I'm back on the Laura Petalum video from last week. I got some people asking that, that did comment that they're hardy in zone 10 where they are. All of those comments were California based. And so I bet it's a uh, zone 10 without uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, extreme summer heat, extreme summer heat uh, that we might get in, the, uh, in some of the Southeast areas, it might be zone 10. So I wondered if they're, that's the difference is the California zone 10 versus the uh, Southeast zone 10, you know, Miami-ish. Uh, kind of places. I interesting, interesting, but there were some people who had it in zone 10, uh, but they were all, every one of those were, Calif were, were California. So, so somebody knows I would not recommend a full screen of Emerald Arbor Vita, but they did it before, uh, before they watched the channel, <laughs> and some have died, uh, pretty, pretty typical of Emerald Arbor Vita. There's no, em Ar there's no Emerald Arbor Vita screen we walked past one, I think we showed it on one of the neighborhood tours, you know, where they had, somebody had attempted this and had already lost three quarters of them. Uh, uh, then some died. He thinks he did not adequately break the root balls up or whatever, whatever happened. Um, should they simply replant more emeralds? That's completely and totally up to you. Uh, for me, I'm probably going to use this opportunity to create a mixed border screen and assume that you know, you may end up losing more of these Emerald Arborvita in the future, but definitely you're better off with a mixed border screen. And keep in mind, I've pointed this out before, these Eastern Arborvita, this uh, Thuja occidentalis, it is actually native to North of Pennsylvania. So we think of these as, we call, there's so many plants we call, this is a native plant. It's not native anywhere near me. Uh, the very peak of Appalachia here in North Carolina, like the top of the top of the mountains, and then north of Pennsylvania up into Canada is where those things are native to. So anything, anybody selling you that as a native plant, you know, it's not really native uh, unless you live in those, just those pockets or in Canada uh, where they're native to, but the heat is very stressful on them. But gosh, there are millions, and I mean millions sold every year. And it wouldn't matter what nursery and, you know, uh, most every wholesale nursery I'd go to in America, 80% of them would have Emerald Arbor Vita in, neat little rows in the nurseries right now because uh, they are easy to they, people like them because they're soft to the touch and you know they grow quickly and when they do well they do well deer will eat them if you have deer issues so keep that in mind as well uh, so somebody wants an evergreen flowering vine in zone 8a virginia so there's an area that's 8a in virginia that norfolk uh, area is uh, actually probably more mild that overall than raleigh is uh, right along the coast of the southeast Virginia. Uh, they want an evergreen flowering vine. Uh, they didn't say what exposure uh, it had for like, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, Carolina jessamine, which is our native vine. Again, I've, I've pointed out that that thing can be quite aggressive. The evergreen clematis, we showed an evergreen clematis, clematis armandii in a video this past uh, week or two weeks ago on the neighborhood garden, neighborhood garden tour video. Uh, that. I love that. I absolutely love that vine. The foliage is so nice. Whether that thing ever flowered or not wouldn't matter to me. The foliage is so nice on it. And then, of course, Confederate jasmine. Once you're in zone eight like that, Confederate jasmine is going to be a, a good one. Any vine is going to require some maintenance uh, for sure. But that's three evergreen vines. 
do we mulch the vegetable garden? This is a question. Some of these questions are from the question and answer two weeks ago, and some are from yesterday, because uh, again, I'm shooting this on Monday. This one was from a couple weeks ago, and I forgot to answer it last week. Do we mulch the vegetable garden? Yes. After we plant our vegetables in the vegetable garden, I have a pile of wood chips set aside that goes in between the rows of vegetables. We do not mulch up on the vegetable plants uh, at all. So there is some bare compost. It's mostly compost over there around the vegetable plants. And then in between the rows is wood chips. Those wood chips over the course of the six months they're laying there as paths in the garden will prevent weeds, hold in some moisture, um, and then also will break down over time and become part of my fall cool season vegetable garden. By the time fall comes around, they'll be broken down nicely and be food for our other plants. Let's see. Um, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, somebody put a red bud in a perfect location, two to three years old, has no blooms. Uh, are there red buds that don't bloom or take time to bloom? They're in 7B, Arkansas. I'll tell you what, some of these new hybrids I get very few flowers, but they are, they do get a few fl more flowers over time, it seems. So my Golden Falls Red Bud has had virtually no flowers on it the first three years it's been in the ground. It has a few more than it's had in the past. And so I'm hopeful that that's a trend in the, in the right direction for more flowers because my native um, Red Bud, which will be in the, uh, you will have seen this past week that I've never shown fully on the channel. Uh, is in absolute full bloom right now. But it does seem like some of the newer hybrid ones that are picked for the gold foliage, um, chartreuse foliage, purple foliage, do bloom a little less overall. Uh, so somebody said their tulips don't seem to have an issue in the Pacific Northwest, thought they needed consistent cold weather. Maybe it's the cool nights. Yes, this is unbelievable. Despite the fact that we're gonna be in a similar zone, uh, 8A, maybe you're even in 8B or 9A in some of those places in the Pacific Northwest, you would think that you would have the same struggles with tulips that we have here in the Southeast. It's all about the number of chill hours you receive, the number of hours below like 50 degrees that you're going to get during the winter time. For us here in my area, it's only 750. 750 is our average number of chill hours. So we have to pick blueberries that are very specific for 700 chill hours or 800 chill hours, that this is how blueberries are bred for different amounts of chill hours. So we, uh, for us, that's mostly rabbit eye blueberries are about 750 chill hours. Believe it or not, up in the Pacific Northwest in a lot of areas, you will get as many, like uh, Seattle will get 3000 chill hours. So you're not getting any colder than we're getting overall, your average low temperature, but you are consistently staying below those below you know in in chill hours longer than we are and in fact four times longer than we are so yes that's why your tulips are performing better despite the fact that we have similar average nighttime temperatures over the course of the year you're lucky from you know san francisco up on the pacific uh, northwest it's just interesting you just don't have the extremes of extreme cold and you don't have although the last few years have had some extreme heat, but normally don't have extreme heat or extreme cold. It allows you to grow a lot of things um, that don't perform in other areas necessarily. It also allows you to mix things. You know, you go to San Francisco, and you see tropicals outside with temperate plants, you know, that need, you know, that's just all over the place. You see this and you just get, you, blow, you know, blows your mind how these things are intermixed uh, with one another. Okay, let's see. Uh, how to prune blue cascade distillium without meatballing them. Refer to the all about loripetalum video. Distillium is a in the witch hazel family with loripetalum, but I pruned my emerald snow loripetalum in that video and I showed off how to just track what you want to do with these branching wispy plants is track branches further down in the plant and cut those off. P track them down in the plant and then leave the ones that are still you know, more in the interior. So it still looks fluffy. I'm looking over at that Emerald Snow Laura Petalum. It looks utterly fantastic. It doesn't look like I meatballed it at all, but I took a foot of growth out of the height of it. So just look at that toward the end of the All About Laura Petalum video from last week. So somebody got Sunshine, I guess Sunshine Ligustrum, they just said Sunshine, and Red Sky Hollies on clearance. How would they revive them? I talked about this last week. A lot of times it's about leaving things alone, right? You can bring home some of these clearance plants and um, you know put you could heal them in you could plant them in a kind of a raised bed situation for a little while let them put on some new growth and then plant them out 
uh, assume that they're probably pretty root bound or were damaged in some way if they ended up on the clearance rack. So you might want to plant them in just kind of a holding space, uh, maybe in your vegetable garden where uh, somewhere you've amended a little more and just let them sit there for a little while. When they start to put on some new growth, you can then transplant them where you want to go. That's one way to do it. Uh, I've, I, there are a ton of pointers to save you time and money in the weekly garden planner. And one of the videos that I did in the weekly garden planner was how to go about selecting clearance plants to make sure you're not wasting your time. So that is a video that's in, in, that, um, in that series of videos. Uh, but, you know, again, sometimes you can just heal things in uh, to some, you could even plant them in a big pile of leaves that are composting, something like that. Give them a, and give them a minute to get themselves back together again. Okay, um, is there any time I would recommend a red maple? So there, you know, there's Japanese maples, which some people will call red maples just because they have red foliage or, or whatever. But when we're talking about, when I'm, red maples I'm talking about are Acer rubrum, which is the, you know, the big giant shade tree maple. You know, they're from, they don't like to play nice with our ornamental gardens. They just don't, but it is the number one planted shade tree bar none. Despite the fact that I have these incredible oaks all over this neighborhood, and if you look at the neighborhood tour video, we showed off one of them in a front yard, a uh, front garden over here that's for sale, house that's for sale. Uh, these oaks are just unbelievable. People are able to landscape around them and garden with them, despite the fact that they're 80 or 90 years old and they're this big around. Uh, but red maples, even small and you know, people struggle to have grass around them or plant around them. They have these fibrous root systems. I've talked about it a lot over the years, but it's by far and away the number one tree that's planted. You, you can go to almost any new neighborhood and it's, I call it seven shrubs in a cloud of dust. Seven shrubs get planted on the foundation and one red maple out in the front yard and they sod the front grass with Bermuda, of course, and then um, whatever they do in the back garden, maybe they sod it, maybe they seed it, and then, uh, then they're gone. But those red maples, um, they have short lifespans typically in urban spaces. Uh, the one took out the one that was in the front garden here, the one in the neighbor's garden there, str really struggling. It's big, uh, but there's nothing pretty about it. <laughs> Not one, nothing appealing about that tree. And it's 30 years old probably. Um, but anyway, they root so aggressively. Is there any time I would recommend one if you had a large piece of acreage? So yes, I love, I mean, it's not that I'm saying that I don't love red foliage on um, red maples or I don't love maple leaves or I don't love the tree, you know, yeah, I, I like them. I just don't think if you're in a typical urban or newer suburban, very small lot and you only get to pick one shade tree, why would you pick one that's going to fight you? Doesn't make any sense to me uh, when you can get other shade trees uh, that would be better off for it. But yeah, if you had a large space and you had a place where you could you know, scale up, then that's where red maples, sugar maples, and other maples that are really aggressive rooting would be, would be great plants. Um, but yeah, not in a small lot. That's where I would avoid it. Uh, so somebody said they have rosette on an older climbing rose. Any advice? Yeah, tear it out. That's the answer. That's the only answer. I saw my buddy, uh, buddy's house over here. I sent him a text message earlier that his, one of his climbing roses has has rosette on it and it just needs to go away. It's uh, if, if, if you have full on rosette on your roses, you need to tear them out because you're protecting your neighbor's roses or other roses that you may have in your garden. If you suspect one has it and you're not confirmed it yet, um, I'm still tearing it out, but you wanna monitor it very closely. They need to be torn out. Every rose that has rosette on it is a vector for you know, for, uh, for, for the disease to continue to spread. I'm, I'm amazed that we haven't gotten more damage in the Raleigh Rose Garden uh, yet, uh, because I see it's completely surrounded by roses that are dying from rosette and no one's taking them out. Uh, even landscape, even landscape professionals. I see up at the Village District uh, where we've, we've shown off some tour videos, uh, uh, roses absolutely eaten up with rose rosette and they're out there mulching around them. They're out there pruning on them, uh, you know, but they need to be taken out. Um, okay, so someone was told if they fertilize their old time azaleas before they bloom, they would have mainly foliage instead of flowers. So when should they fertilize them? Well, okay, so this is, there's a lot in this question, right? Because if I did for, maybe this is true. This, this is one of those things that's always been said that if you fertilize, 
if you go out and throw 10, 10, 10 or whatever around your azaleas too early, that the foliage would race ahead and then your flowers would be down in the plant. You wouldn't see it as well. This probably de totally depends on the season you were in as in you know, the, the temperatures and all kinds of things. If you'll just use organic fertilizer, then these things don't matter. Okay, that's one of those things I've been trying to get across over time is that organic fertilizers only work when the soil temperature is elevated. So, you know, the soil temperature 65 degrees or more, then the soil microbes start working and they start breaking that fertilizer down and then they start feeding your plants. So your old time azaleas, uh, whether, they're, whether they're old azaleas or encore azaleas or any azaleas, the fertilizer that I threw out a month ago isn't necessarily doing all that much yet, okay? It's waiting on these soil microbes to come to life and everything. So if you'll just use organic fertilizer, this timing thing won't matter as much. You can just do it early in the season and then mulch over it uh, later on, you know, when you as whatever process you're using, you don't have to think about this as much. It's when you start using the synthetic fertilizers that you may throw the timing off of things. It's one of the reasons I don't like all these new soil mixes that have fertilizer in them. It seems like it's really hard to go to one of the stores and not buy a container mix or a seed starting mix or some sort of mix that doesn't have fertilizer mixed in with it already. And it not, it's not necessarily the time to be fertilizing, uh, but you, you still fertilizer in the bag and you can't kind of do anything about it. So I don't, again, I like to be in control of the fertilizer and I, this is why I use organic fertilizers. You don't have to think about all these things anymore. Right? It's only going to work when the soil temperature is warm enough for those soil microbes to kick in and start breaking it down and making it available for the plants. By the time all that happens, your azaleas will have bloomed and the new growth will be starting on them in the proper order that it's supposed to happen in. So there's a lot built into that question. Great question. Really great question because it's one of those old pieces of folklore out there. It's more related to we were using, we were to use, we had poor options that we had available and recommendations that we had available for using synthetic uh, fertilizers. Another good question said, are Nandinos root aggressive uh, in a mixed bed of shrubs and perennials? No, not at all. And so when I get Nandina questions, I have to say that there are non-invasive Nandinas because some of the old uh, Nandinas do seed themselves about. They're not you know, of all the invasive plants, I only see the occasional Nandina out in the wooded areas around the city, and they've been planted here for a hundred years. So if they were going, they're not displacing natives. Uh, and then of course I get the bird thing. Oh my, you know, Nandina berries kill birds. When there's like one episode in Georgia that was recorded of this happening 30 years ago, but because the internet is all copy and paste, there's 10 million stories now about birds being killed by nantina berries it's all the same one story just said over and over and over again uh it's just kind of crazy because if nantina berries killed birds there'd be no birds in the southeast because there's nantinas blooming everywhere and nantina berries right this minute everywhere and they just don't get eaten i mean these were some birds that mi mixed up what they were trying to eat they got hungry you know it was a bad, bad situation, but it's not like it's systemic. No one else is, there's not another recording of this. There's just 10,000 stories, retellings of the same story. Uh, anyway, uh, but they are, they do have some invasive qualities, but the newer ones, most, a lot of the newer ones that are coming out don't flower, uh, like lemon, lime, obsession. Uh, that, that's two examples of ones, and that's actually the ones they were asking about. Then get back into getting getting back to their question because again I have to defend and not defend Nandinas. First of all, just answering a question about Nandinas can start a war uh, in the comment section on any video. Uh, then uh, their actual question was, are they aggressive? Root aggressive? No. I pulled out some dwarf Nandina domesticas from the old house in a video very early on in the channel. 20 years in the ground, I put a shovel in the ground, pulled back on it, and the thing leaned right over. They're super, uh, they really are not root aggressive at all. It's amazing. Those were 20 years old, and I don't think I had ever dug one out. Despite all the years I had been in this business, I don't remember it. I had ever dug one out by the roots. And so I was dreading doing that. Now, and, and it was out of the ground, like three shovels, you know, three times with the shovel, and boom, it was out of the ground. So no, they're easy. Um, but they play nice in the beds. Uh, so somebody said their root flares on their trees are buried three or four inches down in the ground. Should they dig it out? No, only if the tree's under stress. 
and they said they did not plant them low. They didn't cover up anything that wasn't exposed already. This had happened at the nursery. Uh, that, so then this happens, you know, pe plants get, trees get field grown over in, a lot of them in Tennessee, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the bare root trees that go to nurseries, but, you know, it gets ordered from a nursery in Tennessee. Uh, they have a machine that digs the trees out of a field bare root, literally no soil on them. They get root pruned a bit, bundled together in groups of 10 or 25 or whatever, shipped to the nurseries and then the nurseries put them in containers. And then a lot of times they end up planted too deep in the containers. Uh, they were planted or they could, you know, they get planted too deep somewhere, somewhere along the line. The landscaper that puts them in, the nurseryman that pots them up, the homeowner that puts them in, whatever it is. And you don't see the root flare. Right at the bottom of the tree, you should see the, you know, where the root flare, every tree out here that I look down at the bottom of, I can see the root flare down at the bottom of it. Real careful to leave those up. At the point where they've been, this has been done for a long period of time, the only ones that I would worry about are ones where the tree is, you just don't think it's, it's languishing in some way. It's just not growing. It, things don't seem normal about it. Then I'm going to assume it's misplanted. And that's true with almost any plant that I have in my garden. I will examine that way. If it's two, three years in the garden, and it's just not doing anything. I'm going to assume that it got misplanted or it's in a spot it doesn't like. Something's going on with it. And then I'll address it then. Somebody said, what are your thoughts about releasing ladybugs into the garden? I, I've never, I've never done it before. I've seen all these companies selling them for years. I did read or somebody maybe told me one time that they just, the vast majority of them fly off or something about them. I don't even remember what it was now. It's just, I've never done it before. I think one of the, and I'm not saying that releasing beneficials out into the garden, you know, is a, I think for most people it's gonna be unnecessary. Uh, another thing that we've included in the weekly garden planner that you can go back, you know, the videos that are on there is about this uh, be patient thing. The bad guys show up before the good guys. Um, the main thing we need to concentrate on in our gardens, again, uh, keeping the soil covered, which I've talked about since day one, but it's all about the number of species that you have in your garden. So we have a ton of different plant species, no monocultures out here. No, <laughs> probably to the point of absurdity uh, in this garden, but there's a ton of plant species, uh, bulbs, perennials, annuals, shrubs, trees, you know, all kinds of vines, all kinds of things. And then we have this, all this life that's under the ground that we've built protecting it with this mulch and all of these species working together create a healthy environment for these plants. But no matter what, <laughs> The ladybug's not going to show up unless you have aphids, right? So you have, the bad guys are going to come before the good guys. Uh, so keep that in mind, you know, that, that you, you, it may be that it takes a year or two to balance the situation out in your garden where the bad guys are showing up before the good guys. Uh, if your plants are being attacked uh, by a lot of different things, then the examination about soil related issues, sun shade related issues on the plants that you have, whether the ground, it, whether it's too wet, overwatering, underwatering, there's probably stresses happening in your space that are causing lots of these issues, but you're still gonna get a few issues regardless. Um, and luckily, if we give in time, if given time, the good guys will show up, but the bad guys show up first because they're food. Uh, and there's no reason for a ladybug to be sitting around waiting for something to happen. Give, give the garden time. Give the garden time and just introduce as many species into it as you possibly can. Somebody's got David Austin roses in zone 7A. They're coming in the mail. Freeze is coming. What should they do? Um, this will be <laughs> a lot of these questions I get. I've answer them too late. <laughs> uh, but if they have a lot of new growth on them, I would put them inside. Uh, no, don't plant them in the ground, you know, with a freeze coming directly on them. Although rose foliage, roses are always ahead of your frost free date. And they're pretty, you know, even the new growth on them like that's usually pretty hardy unless you have something that's like well down in the 20s. It probably wouldn't be hurt. If they've already been planted, you can throw a cover over them. Roses are thorny, so covers can be, you know, a mess sometimes on thorny plants. But, uh, most of the time the foliage is okay if it's just like low 30s, uh, something down in the 20s, I definitely wouldn't plant them. I'd have the plants in the garage or the house for the night and then plant them after that. 
Somebody has a Jane Magnolia with crossing branches. Should they wait until after it blooms to prune it? By the time I've answered this question, it probably will have already finished blooming because flowers are dropping off all the uh, uh, saucer magnolias and the uh, magnolia hybrids uh, in the neighborhood right now. Uh, you, again, those rescue things just do them quickly. I don't care whether it's blooming, losing leaves, gaining leaves, what it is. If you've got crossing branches and things that are going to potentially hurt the plant in some way or hurt itself in some way, get them off sooner the better. Um, so somebody, a bunch of Lorapetalum questions from the Lorapetalum video. Somebody was in zone 6B to 7A. Can they grow purple daydream? Uh, so, I mean, they are definitely marginal in zone 7A. So if you're in 6B, 7A, super marginal definitely have to be in a protected space so it's a balancing act between can you get enough sun on it and can you keep it uh, out of the wind because the wind is the big killer on those things the same thing on the distillium so the distill distillium and lower petalum are probably e distillium is probably a hair less cold hardy overall than the lower petalum uh, but both of them in zone seven require you to not have them in the open open wind area but they do still require sunlight so that can be tricky to find you know you don't want that that northwest wind, that driving northwest wind in the wintertime uh, is really going to hurt leafy evergreens in zone seven spaces. Okay, in zone, in zone 6B spaces for sure. Uh, so somebody says they heard me mention top pruning flamethrower red buds to help improve the thickness. Should they wait to do it till after it leaves out or before new growth? It doesn't matter. Again, it's another one of those things where it's a que it really the question is, is, you know, the plant's going to be hurt at some point. And I didn't, definitely didn't say top them. Uh, it just mean tip prune them. All you have to do to slow a plant down, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing this on this Florida Sunshine Elysium. I get this vertical growth on it, and I have this gap of growth down here at the bottom. So all I do, I can just tip prune it. I can just take like an inch off the end of each branch. I ended up taking about a foot off of this in a video, but I could have just taken one inch off the end of each of these branches. All I'm trying to do is make it wait a second and fill some of this in. For you on that flamethrower red bud, you're just saying, hey, wait, take an inch off the end of each branch. Uh, that's all you need to do. And say, hey, wait, slow down. Let's let the caliper of the tree catch up a bit. So that's all we're doing there. Uh, don't cut too much of it off, just slow it down. And you're probably gonna need to stake it for some period of time. Oh, so somebody, okay. Can they use golden Oakland hollies? I have a couple golden Oakland hollies here. Uh, one in a container, one in the ground. The one in the ground is eight feet tall now. Uh, can, they, can they be pruned into a, con, a continuous rectangle for a formal hedge? I did a tour video over in Village Park or Cam Cameron Park that was um, a formal garden. It was a formal front garden with a uh, little gravel seating area and they had used regular Oakland hollies, no different than the, the golden Oakland hollies, but regular. We walked past there the other day and they filled completely in. They have a completely private front garden space uh, with seating area in it. I wanna go back and film it again because it just, it did, when I filmed it, they were like little soldiers lined up but there were gaps in between them and now they're pruning them about six to eight feet tall and perfect little Christmas trees. But those were Oakland hollies uh, or Robin hollies. I can't remember, it doesn't matter. But Golden Oakland, yes, you can absolutely prune them into a hedge like that. Again, when we're talking about monocultures, you know, you might use a couple of different, you know, maybe that on one side and then something else on the other two sides, just so you don't end up with all the same thing. Somebody, has a uh, dwarf Alberta spruce um, uh, in, I think this was in um, South Florida. Uh, can they bring it inside? No, I, conifers don't do well uh, in too low of light. Uh, you will get, what happens with dwarf Alberta spruce in the hotter areas of the country is they get spider mites and they die. Uh, it's another one of those, it's probably, you know, I don't know where their actually native range is. I'm sure it's way north somewhere around uh, uh, in the world. Uh, but when we try them in the south and you'll see at christmas time you know the garden centers and the box stores and everybody will sell dwarf alberta spruce all over the country doesn't mean you can put them in the ground uh, in in your area outside though again everyone i've ever seen here sometimes they can get some height on them over time eventually though they succumb to spider mites uh, in some way if you bring them inside 
it's a 100% chance probably that you're gonna end up with spider mites uh, killing them unless you had a really bright, bright space. But they need, they're gonna need some winter. Okay, uh, somebody jump-started some dahlias and they're growing vigorously. Can they pinch them back uh, since a freeze is coming and it's gonna be a little while before they can put them in? Uh, yes, yeah, you probably need to pinch them. Uh, you can just pinch a little bit of the top out of them if you want to. If not, uh, you know, try to get them out on the sunniest days you can and make sure, on, on sunny, warm days and make sure they're getting lots of sunlight so they don't stretch too much. Uh, before you get them in the ground. But it's easy to jump start all these things too early. Uh, probably see the little pots on the ground right here where we're doing a little bit of jump starting uh, as well. Uh, somebody said, impatient, growing impatience from seed. Do I have any tips? Yes, don't do it. <laughs> they are the most frustrating. They're the most frustrating things from seed. So when I always talk about seeding my tomatoes or peppers or zinnias or whatever we're starting seed inside, I always talk about backing up from the transplanting date that's on the back of the package. So like for peppers, it'll say six to eight weeks to transplant. That's one of the longer ones that we actually do. So it, so you back up from my average last frost date, April 15th, six to eight weeks. That's where we start the seed. That way, right as my average last frost date is coming up, now it's super sunny. I don't know how, this is probably gonna look terrible. Uh, right as the average last frost date is coming, they'd be in a transplantable size to go into the ground. And patients are like three months. So I'd have to go way back into January to get them started. When I've tried them in the past, I've barely gotten them to germinate about the time that they were going in the ground. So I just go and buy uh, impatiens if I can find them in four or six packs when I've planted impatiens in the garden. I, they're doable for sure. They're just so slow uh, from seed that to the point of frustration for me uh, that I don't do them personally. My tip is back up two months and plant them then. <laughs> <laughs> That's my tip uh, for growing impatience from seed. Uh, oh, okay. So we uh, in the in the in the neighborhood garden tour video from last week, the neighboring garden uh, to the garden we were showing off the landscape job we had done in the past had a lot of rock in their landscape, and they wanted to know why would they do that. They also have plastic grass. Um, apparently it's some sort of allergy issue, related issue. That entire garden is plastic grass and rock. Uh, it's really wild um, that, you know, but anyway, they, th it's th they think it's gonna help their allergies, uh, but you know, I, I have no, I don't know. I have no idea whether that would be workable or not. You know, I know, mo you know, people move to, Phoenix and other places to go into areas with less, you know, if they have severe allergies and that kind of thing. I have no idea if isolating your own garden would have any impact on your neighbor mowing their grass and all these trees, you know, with their pollen and everything else. I, have, I, I don't know if it, would be, if it would actually work for them or not, but that is a plastic grass and rock garden. Okay. Um, okay, somebody said, how should I remove a raised bed? Uh, can they just remove the box and spread the dirt out? Yes, absolutely. That is actually the last question, but yes, that's absolutely the way I would do it. Take, knock the wood off of it or the metal off of it and just spread that compost that you had in there or soil that you had in there far and wide and just leave it as a slight mounded hill. That's absolutely perfect. That's, I've done this before and that will work out great for you. You want your plants to be able to root. Once you get back to growing in the ground, you want the plants to get be able to get down into that existing soil that was underneath it. That's where all the nutrients are. If we want nutrient dense food, we need to have these plants be able to accept, have access to the nutrients that are down in that existing soil. Um, that, that's how we're gonna grow the best nutrient dense food. Uh, but yes, removing them is quick, quick and easy and spread the soil out. So there you go. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to the folks who just yesterday uh, purchased the weekly garden planner and any of you who are considering doing it, again, the code is weekly, uh, and that's good through April 30th to get $30 off the initial release of the weekly garden planner, and there'll be two more months going up in April. And by, by the time we get to midsummer, we'll have the whole year completed, and then we're gonna have hopefully some other surprise additions to it uh, as well that I'm work, currently working on. Thank you guys so much for watching.